Welcome, welcome. Welcome back to our learning session. This is the LIU Nursing Support Program. And we are on our third lecture session. We've been walking our way through biology. We started talking about the cells, the different types of cells, parts, organelles, and how the cells function. And from there, we went to inheritance, how our traits inherited and passed on to the next generation. And from there, that's what we spent the last session doing and today. And our next section session will focus on the human body systems. That's what we've been building up to this entire time. So let's um, get busy with that today. We just pull up our presentation. Let's enlarge that. And let's go into presentation mode. There we go. So once again, this is the LIU Nursing Acad Academic Support. <clears throat> Lecture three, and my name is Trisha Johnson. Remember, this is all sponsored by Learn America. So the topics that we're going to focus on for the next couple of hours, the topics will be digestion, the digestive system, excretory system, gas exchange in the respiratory system, blood circulation, immune system, and the lymphatic system. So it's a lot to cover. Um, we have some time to do it. I'll try to break them down as simple as possible. Pretty much this is an overview of each system. And if you have any questions to go further, please let me know. You could type in in the chat section. I'm just going to check that to make sure that we're up. And go in, yep. Right, so if you have any questions, you're just going to drop that in your chat section. And I will check in from time to time and answer those questions. All right, so let's get going. Okay, so let's start out with the di um, with digestive system. So we're talking about um, all of these body systems. Actually, let's go back some the first session we spoke about the cells, and we we're saying that the cells are the basic unit of function, structure, and function for everything in the body. And so we said that the cells will form together to come together to form tissue. Tissues are then will work will work together to form the organ, and different organs work together to form a system within the organism. We also looked at unicellular organisms, the fact that as a one-cell organism, it has all the different cell organelles, and those cell organelles work as their own, uh, let's say, organ. And so all of those structures work together to carry out the life processes needed in a unicellular organism. When we're talking about multicellular organisms, we're going to see that those organs will work together to form a system. Multiple systems then work together to maintain balance in the organism. And so maintaining that balance is referred to as homeostasis. So homeostasis, it's a, it's a constant change that's going on in the body, constantly where um, elements are moving out of balance and there's a constant correction of that going on. And that constant back and forth is maintaining dynamic equilibrium in our body. Now, a disease or a disorder can disrupt that balance from occurring. And we're going to take a look at a few diseases and disorders in this session today. So physiology is the study of the function and activities of the body systems. All right, we'll start out with the digestive system. So the digestive system is when you take in and process food to provide the body with chemicals and energy needed for metabolism. And if we go back, metabolism is all the chemical activities that's needed for cellular activities uh, to occur. And for all of those met metabolic processes to take place, we're going to need some form of energy. And that energy originate from the nutrients of the food that you're bringing in. So let's take a look at the digestive system. So 
So we have egestion, sorry, ingestion, meaning that food is taken in and the food will be taken in from the mouth area. And we're gonna see that as it enters the mouth, we're gonna see that the tongue plays a role in changing the form of the food. The teeth plays a role. The saliva that's in the mouth, that's gonna play a role in the process of the food, in processing the food. In the mouth, you also see that there are different glands that's going to participate in this. Once the food has been transformed in the mouth, based on the chemical reactions that will take place and the me mechanical reactions, once it's then formed into this ball, it would then move through the esophagus. From the esophagus, it's going to make its way down into the stomach. The stomach is then made up of muscles and gases and um, acids, I should say, in this area that's going to help to process the food even more. We're going to see that specific parts of the food is um, processed only in the stomach. From the stomach, it's going to leave and then go into the small intestine, which here's all the small intestines. Okay, so as it goes into the small intestine, we're going to see that the gallbladder is going to come into play. Um, the liver produces bile, it will store up in the gallbladder. We'll see that will be secreted into the small intestine. The pancreas will also come into play here. Pancreas is located right behind the stomach. And we're going to see that they're def definitely different intestinal juices coming into play to process and break down the food even more. Once it's broken down to its simplest form, it's going to get absorbed into the blood through from the, from the small intestine into the blood by way it's going to get absorbed in the process of diffusion where we're going to go from high concentration to low concentration. And we see the large intestine is where the waste matter will then be processed through the large intestine. But we also have in the large intestine, we're going to see vitamins are going to come into play there. We're going to see water absorption being important in that process of the body. And we will get rid of any undigested material through the large intestine. So a lot of areas to cover today. And what I'm going to do is uh, minimize it or condense the information into small chunks that you could just take in and um, process. All right, so I wanted to take this time, too, to compare the unicellular organism in comparison to the multicellular organism. So it says multicellular organism digestion takes place outside of the cell. So what happens is we have the, the canal where the food starts and gets processed, the food does not get, or the nutrient does not get into the cells until it's absorbed into the bloodstream. And then it's from the bloodstream, it's carried to cells, where cells will then take it in. So it's important to know that digestion does not occur inside of the cell. It's occurring outside, which is in the alimentary canal. And then once it's processed, it's absorbed and carried to the cell. And so that's how, uh, so for multicellular organism, that process is more extracellular digestion. Whereas in a unicellular organism, remember we said that each organelle function as its own um, processing area. So the digestion takes place intercellular, intercellular. All right, so plants. This is a quick review of plants. Most of us know this. I wanted to throw plants in because they're living things and they carry out a nutritional process themselves. So plants. See if you could fill in the blanks with any of these. Let me give you a moment to think of this. Okay, 
So what I was looking for in this section is that plants are autotrophs. Autotrophs, they make their own food. They make their own food through a process of photosynthesis. Plants take in water, carbon dioxide. And what's produced? Sugar, which is stored as starch, and oxygen. What is being released? What's being released is the oxygen, and that sugar, I already gave away the answer, but the sugar is stored in the form of starch. So let's go through each step of the digestive process. So nutrients, we refer to those as the usable parts of the food. And digestion process is to break down the food into smaller usable forms. There are two types of digestion that takes place in the digestive system. There's mechanical, then there's chemical. Mechanicals is when you're physically changing the food. So you have a large piece, now you're in smaller pieces. That's a physical change. Whereas in chemical digestion, the chemical components are changed into something else. And remember, this all occurs outside the cell. And once the process is completed, then it will be absorbed into the cell. And so I went through the image before, but here's the path of digestion. Let's take a second and look it over. All right, and so let's um, take a look at each section. So in the mouth, we refer to the food going into the mouth. The process of taking in the food into the mouth is called ingestion. In the mouth, the teeth and the tongue is actually gonna help to mechanically change the food. And so the teeth, you're tearing and ripping the food into pieces, is a mechanical breakdown. So we have the canines, which are in towards the front, the incisors. Up front, these guys, their job is to tear and rip the food, while the molars in the back are there to grind the food. So you're physically, mechanically changing the food. Whereas the tongue is going to be there to moisten the food, and it's going to be moistened with the saliva. And so if you look at the saliva, if you look at my image, the saliva um, is made up of these different parts. All right, and so we could see the pharynx. The pharynx is the first part of the digestive um, intestinal tract, which is involved in digestion. It is present in the mouth, nasal cavity, cranial, and esophagus. So that whole section together is referenced in the pharynx. As food and air pass through the pharynx, a tissue called epiglottis closes the trachea and passes the food to the esophagus. So when you're swallowing, there's this little flap that sits there. So when the food is passing by, it closes the air trap. This is a, to avoid food from going down the wrong pipe. You know, you've heard that before. Don't talk while your mouth is full or while you're chewing. And that's because when you're swallowing, that flap goes over that air trap. But when you're speaking, that flap flips up to let air through. So um, you don't want to choke if you're talking and eating, chewing, swallowing your food at the same time. It's possible that the flap could be up because you're speaking and the food could end up going in the wrong area. So I think I have a video of that. We could see that coming up soon. But um, the tongue itself uh, has saliva and saliva contains enzyme. These enzymes will start the breakdown of starch into simple sugar. So we're seeing a chemical transformation take place where we see the carbohydrate, the starch that's in your food. Initially, that chemical change takes place from the enzymes that's found in your saliva. And so like even if you were to take like a plain cracker and start to just chew it and chew it over a long period of time, just for a little while until it becomes completely mush and you chew it, you could actually get like a sweet taste from it. And that's because the starch will be converted 
into sugar. Then once it's in this, um, once it's transformed by the chewing and the saliva, it then moves down into your esophagus. And so it is about 25 centimeter, like 10 inch muscular tube connected from your throat to your stomach. It helps the movement of food in a rhythmic contraction. This rhythmic movement is called peristalsis. It's like a wave-like motion sending food down into your stomach. And so usually when you, that's a, a process that you um, don't even think about doing. It automatically goes on its own. It's not something that you control. So once that peristalsis movement is going, like it's on its own, it's an involuntary muscle action. And so it takes about 10 seconds to move the food through the entire esophagus to the stomach. How many of you knew that? So um, there's different parts to the process of moving the food or different parts to the esophagus as the food moves through it. And so the stomach is a temporary storage place for the food. This is where food is then mixed with all these gastric juices, but the um, muscle, the stomach muscle, also plays a part in breaking down the food mechanically, even into smaller pieces, right? And this is called um, churning, churning the food. And so food is then formed into this bolus, which is like just this clump of food, and um, that's just a mix glob of food, and it is then passed into the small intestines. And so the stomach, once again, mechanically changes the food into smaller pieces by the contraction of the muscles, the muscle tissue that makes up the stomach. And um, the gas trick juice that's found in the stomach, we have hydrochloric acid that chemically breaks down the food. And so the hydrochloric acid has a couple of advantages in the stomach. The hydrochloric acid, it's there to kill the bacteria. So if you um, took in something that has um, some sort of bacteria on it, that hydrochloric acid will destroy, at least we hope that it does, but that's the purpose of it being there, that it will break down um, bacteria, kill them. And also another important role is that the hydrochloric acid is also there to set your stomach acid at a certain pH so that the enzyme that's working in your stomach is in the proper enzyme um, environment to carry out the enzyme activity of breaking down proteins in your stomach. So we're going to see that it's in your stomach where protein gets broken down into amino acids. So remember, in your mouth, the saliva changes starch, chemically changes starch into sugar. It's in your stomach where protein is chemically changed to amino acid. And you have those enzymes that's found there, and the hydrochloric acid makes it the perfect environment for those um, enzymes to do their thing. In the following media, you will learn about the stomach. Yeah. Human stomach is like a bag and has thick muscular walls. It is in the shape of a flattened U. It is broader than the other parts of the alimentary canal. The food is pushed into one end of the stomach by the esophagus. The stomach then pushes the digested food into the small intestine through its other end. The lining inside the stomach releases mucus, hydrochloric acid, and other digestive juices. The mucus shields the lining inside the stomach. The acid destroys the harmful microorganisms present in the food. The secretion of such acids into the stomach helps in maintaining an acidic medium that prevents bacterial growth. It also aids the juices in the stomach to act upon the food. The digestive juices reduce the complex protein components into simpler forms. Thus you have learned about the stomach.
Great. I love these videos. Remember, you have access to this at the um, support class site through um, Learn America. Uh, I'm glad I ran the video because I forgot to mention the mucus line, and that, that's very important inside the stomach because you have this strong hydrochloric acid that's found there, so the mucus is there to protect that stomach lining. All right, let's continue. So past the stomach, that takes us, oh, look at that. I made myself a note. It's too fast. All right, so once again, quick review of the chemical digestion that's taking place in the stomach. Is that the hydrochloric acid is destroying the bacteria in the food and providing the proper pH for enzyme action. And those um, gastric juices, they contain enzymes that will begin the chemical digestion of proteins into amino acids. Like pepsin is an enzyme that begins that protein digestion. All right, so chyme is like the, th the thick, soupy liquid, um, partially digested food. Ch this is the material that will then be expelled from the stomach into the small intestine. So once it's completely processed. And that brings us to the small intestine. And so the small intestine now, where the, it's the grand finale of the digestive process as far as getting the nutrients out of the food, the small intestine is a long segment of the digestive system. It is about 20 feet long, which is, it's completely coiled up, and part of the coiling helps to increase surface area for absorption. The digestion is impossible without the small intestine. The chemical substance, like enzymes, play a main role in the process of digestion in the small intestine. Nutrients in the food are absorbed into the blood from this um, section. So the duodenum, the ileum, and the genium are three parts of the small intestines. Always love them idioms. And um, so the different parts of the small intestine, we're going to see play different roles, but the idea that I, what I want you guys to walk away with is that this is the final stage of the digestive process and everything will be absorbed into the blood. And from there, that's how you get the nutrients into the cells. So food is completely digested here. Nutrients get absorbed into the blood. We're going to also see that the liver will produce bile, which is stored in the gallbladder. And the purpose of the bile being sent into the small intestine is to emulsify fat. So we spoke about carbs starting the process in the mouth. We spoke about proteins starting to break down in the stomach, and we're going to see that fat is going to get emulsified and completely broken down in the small intestine. So emulsification of fat is just taking those large drops and breaking them down into smaller pieces. The pancreas will secrete pancreatic juices into the small intestine to complete the digestion. So um, the pancreatic juices contain all these enzymes to complete the digestion of starch, complete the digestion of protein, complete the digestion of our lipids. Now, once they're small enough, you have these finger-like projections that are found in the wall of the small intestine, and it's in these finger-like projections where the absorption takes place. In the following media, you will learn about the small intestine. Let's take a look. The small intestine is 7.5 meters long, and it is extremely coiled. The pancreas and the liver secrete juices into the small intestine. The walls of the small intestine also secrete juices. The, the liver is a gland juices. which is located in the upper portion of the abdomen on the right side. It is reddish brown in color. The liver is the largest gland in the body. Bile is secreted by the liver. The gallbladder is a sac-like structure which stores the secreted bile. The bile is used in the digestion of fats. The pancreas is situated beneath the stomach. 
It is large and cream in color. The juice secreted by the pancreas breaks down the complex carbohydrates, fats, and proteins into simpler components. The stomach partially digests the food and pushes it into the small intestine. The intestinal juices in the small intestine act on the food and complete the digestion. The carbohydrates are broken down to glucose. Which is a simple sugar. Triglycerides are digested to fatty acids and glycerol, and the proteins are broken down into amino acids. Thus, you have learned about the small intestine. Right, and those finger-like projections you saw in the video, that's what the villi is. Um, so these little projection, they help to increase the surface area inside the small intestine, and that's where the nutrients are absorbed, and each one of those um, projection is connected. They have capillaries inside of them, and that's the direct contact with the blood supply, and from there, it's then passed around the body. Whatever the nutrients is, it's amino acid, simple sugar. We know that simple sugar will eventually use for ATP molecules later for energy, so those are absorbed into the blood, and the cells will pick those up and use to carry out their metabolic activities. Pretty fascinating. The following media. All right, so here's just a breakdown, a little takeaway from um, the small intestine. That first, the digestive material is passed into that epithelial tissue of the villi. The, the, villi. <clears throat> the nutrients is absorbed to the lacteal. The lacteal is a section within each villi. Villi. <laughs> And from the lacteal, nutrients gets diffused into the bloodstream from the capillaries. So these are different parts of the villi. And that ends the section of the small intestine and now brings us to the large intestine. So from the small intestine, we have all the nutrients going into the blood, which is what we want. We want the materials to be broken down. They're completely digested, small enough so that they could diffuse into into the blood, they're taken to wherever they're needed. Now, we still have the large intestine. So these are the non, the undigestible materials. So no digestion takes place in this portion. So the large intestine is a small tube, but it's wider than the small intestine. I mean, it's about five feet. The large intestine absorbs extra or excess water and salt in the food and helps that will help in the digest in digestion. And so the large intestine, all the undigested food material will turn into stool or fecal matter, and then it will be excreted or egested from the body through the rectum and the anus. And so one of the key things to walk away with from the large intestine is that this is where we're gonna have a lot of reabsorption of water, which is necessary in the blood. We also see absorption of vitamins. And so we have a lot of bacteria in that area also to help with processing vitamins. And we eliminate the undigested or indigested materials. Right. So let's do a quick review of all the sections we've done so far. Primary function of the digestive system are the breakdown of food and absorption of nutrients. function of the digestive system are the breakdown of food and absorption of nutrients. The breakdown of food is called digestion. In mouth, food is broken down into smaller pieces through a process called mastication. It results in formation of food bolus. Salivary glands located near oral cavity secrete saliva. It begins chemical digestion. After mastication, food is swallowed. Take a look at that big lot. The soft palate prevents food from entering the nasal cavity. Food particles are pushed through the pharynx to the esophagus. The esophagus connects the pharynx to the stomach. 
You see what happened to the epiglottis? Food bolus enters the stomach. Stomach cells secrete hydrochloric acid. Chemical reactions of enzymes like pepsin digest food bolus. Bolus is further broken down by muscular contractions in stomach. It mixes up with secretions to form a thick liquid called chyme. Bile from liver and enzymes from pancreas empty into duodenum to digest chyme. Microvilli of jejunum and ileum absorb nutrients into blood and lymph. Water and mineral salts are absorbed in colon. Undigested material will be eliminated from body through the anal opening. And that's that from beginning to end. So hopefully um, you got the gist of the digestive system from beginning to end. Um, starting from the mouth to the anus, we've gone through all the different process of digesting food. And so that video was a good overview. If you missed any portion of it, you could go back. Um, this video was a good summary of what we did so far. So uh, just as we, just before we close off the section on the digestive system, to look at there are some things that could go wrong, like an ulcer, which is a sore in that stomach lining. So we have a, a wear down of that mucus area. Remember, we have a lot of acids in that. That could be treated with medication and proper diet. Tooth decay, so we're talking in the mouth, that could be caused from bacteria, and that could be treated with brushing, flossing, regular de dental visit. Um, an appendix, um, that's one, another disorder where it could be ruptured or infected. Appendicitis is an issue of the, it's an infected appendix. That could be treated um, with surgery, could be removed. But if it bursts, it can infect any neighboring cells um, if it's not removed. Diarrhea is another malfunction of the homeostasis or the balance of the digestive system. This is where not enough water is being reabsorbed back into the large intestine, so there's too much water, and that's what the diarrhea is. Whereas constipation is when too much water is reabsorbed back into the large intestine. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the digestive system. So right now we're gonna, let me just move some of these images around. All right, so we're gonna go to our next system, and our next system is the excretory system. So the excretory system, a lot of people think the excretory system is where um, stool or fecal matter is removed from the body, but we just saw in the last section that that's a part of the digestive system. Excretory system is dealing with metabolic waste. This is the waste that is created from a cellular process. So there's a big difference, whereas in the digestion, we saw the elimination of waste products. But in excretion, we're going to see that it's the waste product of metabolic. It's a me waste product from a metabolic activity. Two completely different processes, but oftentimes people will get those confused. So the removal of metabolic waste from the cell, metabolic waste is waste produced by metabolic activities. Some examples of meta metabolic waste, carb uh, carbon dioxide, water, urea, mineral salt. Those are a few examples. Some of, some of the structures that are responsible for these waste products or the, um, where these waste products are origina originating from would be the lungs, skin, liver, and the kidneys. So let's take some time, next few minutes, reviewing them. So from the lung, we're going to see that it's going to ex excrete carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and some water, they're going to diffuse and so when you exhale out, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the respiratory system. So an exhalation, exhalation is when you get rid of uh, carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct or a waste product from several processes in our body. Next, skin. From the skin, we see that we have sweat glands, and they're going to um, perspire 
through the pores. So in perspiration, we're going to see some nitrogenous waste, salt, and water. Whereas the liver, the liver's job, it removes poisons um, such as alcohol from your blood. It also changes glycogen to glucose, but it excretes urea and bile. Let's look at urea. Urea is a nitrogenous waste resulting from the breakdown of amino acid produced during protein digestion. Let's take a look at the kidneys. So the kidney now is a part of the urinary system. So the excretory system is made up of a couple sections. Let me go back. So the excretory system is made up of the lungs, skin, liver, kidneys. I went over what's going to be removed from the lung, what's going to be removed from the skin, what's being removed from the liver. Now I want to tackle the kidneys. And so the kidneys, they fall into a different category as far as they are part of the urinary system, the system that's going to produce urine, but also they are part of the excretory system. So um, your kidneys, their function is to filter your blood. So they're the cleaning station for your blood. So as blood flow through your body, dropping off, picking up different things, it's going to go through the kidney to get clean. And so um, we're going to see once it's clean in the kidneys, it's going to one of the, the waste products. So let me start over. As it's being cleaned in the kidney, there are some things that are pulled out and uh, things such as salt, urea, uric acid, glucose is pulled out. Um, some of the amino acids are pulled out. So what you want to put back, the stuff that's going to get reabsorbed back, is the stuff that we need, like the... Um, glucose, the amino acids, some of the water, some of the salt, we still need those. So they're going to get reabsorbed. So everything is cleaned out. Those things that we need will reabsorb. What's left are the waste products. This is so fascinating. Those waste products, um, such as some of the uric acid, the urea, um, some of the water, some of the salt, they are going to then leave the kidney by way of the ureter, which is this tube here, and the ureter then leaves, um, I'm sorry, let me go back, all that material makes up urine, and so urine then passes through the ureter down to the bladder where it will be stored, and then it leaves the body by way of the urethra. So I think this is one of the most fascinating sections, like the human body itself is fascinating. And so um, those are the major parts of the urinary system. So if we take a closer look inside the kidney, inside the kidney itself, we have these um, matrix area found in the section. You have the cortex, which is the outer section of the kidneys, but inside you have this matrix. Inside the matrix you have nephrons, and nephrons are really the filtering machine. That's, it's within those structures that the blood actually gets cleaned. And so blood is going to enter and leave, um, enter through the vein, the renal vein, and then leave by way of the renal artery. Okay, so um, this nephron, I says the structure, this is where it happens. This is where the filtering process takes place. Uh, this is the machine that cleans out the blood. The structure inside the kidney allows the blood to pass through and remove products. Let's take a look at this. Formation of urine begins at glomerulus of Bowman's capsule. All right, so I'm going to pause this because this gives us a good picture of this area. So here you could see the Bowman's cap, the um, Glomerus capsule, uh, not capsule, but Bowman's capsule. Excuse me, <laughs> messing up a lot today. Here we go. So the Bowman's capsule is where the artery, you'll see that comes into play here. And so what's going to happen is blood's going to diffuse in by way of the Bowman's capsule. It will go through the section 
um, it goes through the material and we have a loop that's down here and the materials will get reabsorbed back. So we have a filtering process that takes place, a reabsorption process, and then the waste product will leave through that collecting duct. And so let's see, the video is going to get more detail. I just wanted to give you an overview so you don't get too confused with all the different parts. Water and smaller molecules are pushed into Bowman's capsule from glomerulus. Proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbs water and solutes from glomerular filtrate. Nephron cells help to transport sodium ion solutes, like glucose and amino acids, from tissue fluids. Active transport of sodium ion is followed by passive transport of chloride ion. Solutes diffuse out from proximal convoluted tubule to tissue fluid. It causes the water to follow by diffusion. Peritubular capillaries transport water and solutes to tissue fluids. Then they will return to venous blood leaving kidneys. Despite proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbs largely water and solute, fluids entering Henle loop show similarity in overall concentration of blood plasma. So we see a lot of absorption taking place here. Reabsorption of sodium ion and chloride ion from tubule increases since solute's concentration rises in tissue fluid. This is happening through the fusion. Water leaves tubules by osmosis as concentration increases at surroundings. As a result, water flows towards bottom of medulla. Hence, descending limb becomes more concentrated. Sodium ion and chloride ion can permeate ascending limb, but water cannot. The ions diffuse out of tubule and reach medulla. <clears throat> Descending limb loses water by osmosis. As a result, fluid concentration reduces in distal convoluted tubule than blood plasma. Renal medulla increases fluid concentration in surrounding tissues since the solutes are left behind them. When water flows towards collecting duct, the tubule loses water osmotically. Now, as fluid enters distal convoluted tubule, it is less concentrated to surrounding cortex. Concentration in collecting duct becomes similar to blood plasma as it receives fluid from tubule. Urea and other wastes make greater proportions in sodium ion and chloride ion solute content. They are finally moved out of the tubule. Henle loop increases solute concentration as collecting duct descends. Urine is concentrated in collecting duct as solute concentration gets increased. It causes more water to be absorbed. See, I told you that this was a very intricate process, one of the most fascinating process to me. And so there's so many, much details in this one process. Let's say you have access to this video, you could go back and take it one step at a time. And um, that's why I did an overview in the beginning so that you get it that as the blood comes in the, through the fusion, materials are passed in through that Bowman capsule. Materials are then passed through the tube of the nephron where materials are absorbed, materials are diffused out, and the stuff that the body doesn't need will then pass on. And eventually in the collecting duct will be in the form of urine. From there it will be passed on to the urethra. 
okay? And so, um, once again, you could go back and break that video down into more intricate parts to view each section thoroughly. But the overview is that the kidney filters out the blood, and in the nephron is where even good and the stuff that we don't want is filtered out, but the stuff that we need will get reabsorbed back. You see some osmosis coming into play there, some diffusion coming into play, but at the end you end up with the uric acid, urea, some salt, some water to form urine, which is then set to send to the um, bladder for storage. And um, some of the disorder, excuse me, if we look back, we have um, this section here. So the collecting duct will lead into this area. Let me get my pen. You can't see where I'm pointing. In this area here. And so in this area, what could happen? There could be a buildup of calcium in that area. And so that's how we end up with kidney stones. We end up with kidney stones. Um, because the calcium will harden and form a blockage. And so um, the waste material cannot pass from the kidney to the urethra, or it could block in the urethra so that it wouldn't get in the bladder. And so there's sound wave technology that can help to smash that, or sometimes you have to wait for a kidney stone to pass out and never happen, but I hear that it's very painful. Dialysis. Um, is a process where if there's kidney failure, where you will depend on a machine to do the process, the filtering of your blood. Goit is where there's uric acid crystals produced or deposited in your joints. Um, urema is where the body cells become poison and poisoned and there is blood in the urine. This is caused when urea and other wastes are not filtered out of the blood properly. Cirrhosis of the liver is um, a disease of the liver where this is caused by damaging, caused damage to the cell. And so we see this also, remember, um, the liver will try to take out poisonous substance such as alcohol. So um, a heavy drinker, this is something that they could end up having because of that poison that, from the alcohol. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. That's another disorder that we could see with this system. There's also skin problem, clogging the pores, blackheads, acne. Those are disorders of the excretory, I'm sorry, the, yes, excretory system. See, in this section, we have the excretory and the urinary system working as one. All right, so that was a quick run through of the excretory system. So we did digestion, excretory. And once again, if you have questions to go in more detail, let me know what angle you would like to take with this. But um, this is an overview to just give you an understanding of the process. We're going to move on to respiration. Let me give you a second. Let me just check in. All right, if there are any questions, let's go back to the next section. All right, so the next process we're going to go through, we're going to go through the respiratory system. And so the respiratory system, this is a process where stored energy, this is where you release energy from food. There's two types of respiration that takes place, there's external respiration and internal respiration. So it occurs outside, external respiration occurs outside the cells and involves the exchange of gases between the lungs and the blood. Whereas internal respiration takes place where gas exchange between the blood and the body cells. So we're going to break down those sections. Before we do, I want to give you a quick review of the respiratory. Many of you probably already know it, but let's watch a quick video on what is the respiratory system and what is involved in it. 
The human respiratory tract consists of the nose, the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. The trachea is further separated into two bronchi. This is another view of the morphology of the respiratory tract. The trachea, left lung, pulmonary blood vessels, and heart are the visible parts. The lungs consist of five lobes, the upper, middle, and the lower lobes in the right lung, the upper and the lower lobes in the left lung. All right, so I'm just going to take that back so I can kind of walk you through the section. Let's take a look. Uh, the human respiratory tract consists of the nose, the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. All right, so let's take a look at this image. P pathway of the respiratory system. There we go. So like I said, we have this nose. So we're going to have air passing through this section here. We have air that's going to also pass through this area here, through the mouth. And so the pharynx, which is another name for the throat, that's where, that's that pathway where either air and food will go through. Right? That's what the pharynx is. So we see that entrance over here. This is the tongue right here in the mouth. So we're passing through. There's that little soft palate that closes up when you eat to avoid food from going in that air tract, the nasal cavity. And so here we have the pharynx where both will meet. Now in this we have um, the larynx. Right, we'll find our vocal cord in this area. And so past this area is where air will enter into the trachea, which is also known as your windpipe. So this epiglottis here is that flap that when you eat closes, it sits down over this section to prevent food from entering in. But when you speak, it opens up to allow air to pass through the vocal cord, cord so that you can make sound. Right, so this is an up close look at the beginning of the respiratory. The trachea is further separated into two bronchi. This is another view of the morphology of the re Okay. Once again, I'm a clicker, I guess. Respiratory tract. Let's go back. The trachea is further separated into two bronchi. All right, so I want to take a look at this section. Let's look at it. Oh, wow. I'm telling you. There we go. The human respiratory tract consists of the nose, the mouth, the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. The trachea is further separated into two bronchi. Okay, this is where I want us to stop. Let me see. Here we go. There we are. So what we're looking at at the other angle, an angle we have here, the larynx is in here. Um, leading down into your trachea. And so you see the trachea has these ring, cartilage ring, represented with the blue or bluish green color around them. And so here's the trachea, and the trachea will eventually branch out into bronchus, or the bronchus tube. And each one of these little will then further break down into the bronchioles, which are smaller tubes that's found in the lungs. So this is the area where the air will pass down and divide out into the right the left lung. This is another view of the morphology of the respiratory tract. The trachea, left lung, pulmonary blood vessels, and heart are the visible parts. All right, and so what you could see here from this image now, what I showed you before, on the trachea, so from the trachea going down, there are the rings, divide down the bronchi, bronchi divide, and so in the lungs we'll see those bronchial tubes, um, the bronchioles, 
and we're going to see that there's going to be a gas exchange taking place in the air sacs that's found at the tip of those two. All right, so things that you should know about respiratory surfaces. For respiration to take place, um, the air, it has to be moist, thin area for gas to diffuse across that membrane. And so um, it's usually surrounded by capillaries. I uh, believe, let's think about like worms. You ever see like on a rainy day, um, you'll see them all over because they, respiration takes place through their skin. And so they could be in an area where there's so much water now, and that could prevent gas exchange from taking place. So just to give you a visual, but um, in our lungs, our lungs are moist, and those thin sections at the end of each bronchioles are gonna be so thin that gas will be able to pass through. The gas exchange section of our lungs is referred to as the alveoli or the alveolus. Um, they are connected directly to capillaries. Waste products from respiration, like carbon dioxide and water vapors, will pass through this section. So we're going to take another look at that. Let's go have another video for it. I love these videos. Let's. Gas exchange takes place during respiration. The gas is exchanged between body and atmosphere. All right, so this is where I wanted to stop it. Sorry about that. I like to stop and talk through the videos so that um, I could try to break down or give you a visual of what's going on. So here, the alveoli in the lung, that is the smallest part of the, the lung itself. So it's at, at the tip of the bronchioles tube. You find these air-like sacs, which are called alveoli. They, all, they almost look like a cluster of grapes. And so they're going to have a con direct connection to the capillaries. And so remember, the blood is flowing all around the body. In the capillaries, the blood is going to then come with the waste products that is picked up over around the different parts of the body. And so remember, I said in the last unit that the lungs were part of the excretory system. This is why, because the blood is going to bring um, that carbon dioxide to the lungs, to the section where the alveoli is, and because it's so thin, gases will be able to diffuse from out of the blood and go in. So you're going to have where carbon dioxide is going to go into the alveoli, and as we breathe out, we breathe out that carbon dioxide as a waste product. When we breathe in, we breathe in the oxygen, so the oxygen is going to be here in that tip of the of the lung, and as we breathe in, through the fusion, it's going to get forced into the blood. So the blood is coming to the lung to drop off gas, waste, and to pick up gases that's needed for, such as oxygen, that's needed for other um, metabolic activities. Let's keep watching. Atmosphere through blood. The partial pressure of oxygen is greater in alveoli than blood. Hence, the oxygen diffuses into red blood cells from lungs. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less in lungs than blood. Therefore, carbon dioxide diffuses into lungs from red blood cells. Pulmonary veins carry the oxygenated red blood cells to heart. Eventually, the heart pumps blood to other parts of the body through arteries. Carbon dioxide is higher in body tissue than blood. The carbon dioxide starts diffusing into blood from body tissue. The lungs replenish the blood with oxygen through gaseous exchange and removes carbon dioxide. All right, so I'm going to run through this video again, but I'm going to stop it just so you could see different parts of the process. All right, so. Gas exchange takes place during respiration. The gas is exchanged between body and atmosphere through blood. The 
partial pressure of oxygen is greater in alveoli than blood. All right, so that partial pressure in the alveoli. So we're talking about oxygen. So remember, as you breathe in, right, in the process of breathing, your lungs are filling up. So that pressure of oxygen is increased. And so because of the fusion, you have a high concentration of oxygen inside. So then that's going to force the oxygen to move from an area of high into an area of low concentration, which is in the blood cell. So that's how you get that blood moving across. Hence, the oxygen diffuses right into there. red blood cells from lungs. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less in lungs than blood. And so now what you're seeing is that there's more carbon dioxide in the blood when it gets to the lung because it's picked up the carbon dioxide as waste products from different metabolic activities around the body. So because the pressure is now greater inside the bloodstream, now because of diffusion, that's going to cause the carbon dioxide to diffuse from the blood into the lung. Therefore, carbon dioxide diffuses into lungs from red blood cells. Pulmonary veins carry the oxygenated red blood Okay, so now they, the video mentioned pulmonary veins. And so those pulmonary veins, they're connected back to the heart. Because remember, the heart is pumping the blood to the lungs and to, I'm sorry, to the different parts of the body. So it's going to send the blood out to the lungs to go pick up oxygen, drop off carbon dioxide. It's also going to bring the blood back to the lung so that now that new um, blood, that blood that is filled with oxygen, that oxygenated blood is going to come back into the heart. And then the heart is now ready to pump that to the different parts of the body that's, that's waiting on that oxygen. It needs that oxygen. So in this image here, it's showing you a pathway of here's the lung up top. This is where that gas exchange just took place. So now we have an oxygen-rich blood that's going to come back to the heart. And see, we have the tissue down here. That oxygen-rich rich blood will then be transferred to the body tissues. Cells to heart. Eventually, the heart pumps blood to other parts of the body through arteries. Carbon dioxide is higher in body tissue than blood. And so, and before we went on, we saw the systemics and this pulmonary system. So if you look at the blood flow in two different ways, there's the pulmonary system where, send, where the blood is sent out to the lungs for that gas exchange, and then there's the systemic exchange where the blood is sent to all the different parts around your body to drop off and pick up um, gases and nutrients. So, but in this particular situation, we're talking about gas exchange. So it's sent to the different system to pick up and drop off gases. And so now it's saying that carbon dioxide, as it flows, as the blood flows to the body system, there's a buildup of carbon dioxide in the body tissues because of the metabolic reactions that's taking place carbon dioxide is high. So there's a higher pressure in the tissue, and then that's going to cause it to diffuse from an area of high concentration in the body tissue into a low concentrated area into the blood, and the process continues again. That would, the blood would then bring it to the lung to put the carbon dioxide in the lung so we could breathe it out and pick up more oxygen from breathing in and take it to the tissue sample. Section. The carbon dioxide starts diffusing into blood from body tissue. The lungs replenish the blood with oxygen through gaseous exchange and removes carbon dioxide. Okay, so for that gives you a better understanding of the gas exchange process in the respiratory system. Gas and so um, breathing is an intricate part of that exchange. So breathing is the process of moving the respiratory gas. Oftentimes when I'll ask students about what is respiration, they're like, they'll yell out breathe in. But no, breathing is one of the process that's involved in the respiratory process. The respiratory process is to provide you with that gas that is needed for cellular respiration, to provide your body with energy. And so breathing is the process that's gonna help you to bring in that oxygen 
that's going to be taken to your cells for cellular respiration in production of ATP. And exhaling is going to help you to push out that waste product. So breathing is a process in the respiratory um, process. And so inhalation is bringing in the air. So as you breathe in, that diaphragm contracts up. You have your lungs will expand and they'll fill up with air. And as you exhale, the pressure, uh, pressure then um, causes the air to be forced out through the body. So there are a couple of malfunction or disorders that can affect the respiratory process, so, such as uh, bronchitis. Bronchitis is inflammation of the lining of the bronchial tubes. And so this call the bronchioles to secrete much more mucus than necessary. And so that's going to interfere with the transfer of gases. And so what you see, this person will probably have shortness of breath. You'll oftentimes, they'll be coughing up mucus. Asthma is when the bronchial tubes narrow, preventing oxygen from entering the lungs. And so um, asthma could be caused by different things. So it's really unknown, the... Um, many of the causes, but it's looked at as an allergic reaction. And so there are things that can, can be associated with it, like um, air pollution, smoking. Um, these are just common things that can lead to it. And so what happens is this person will feel, have a sense of suffocation, where they're not able to pass air properly through the system because those tubes have become so narrow. So many times they'll take medication to loosen, to relax those tubes. High blood pressure occurs when blood pressure increases in the artery. Linked to stress, diet, it could be hereditary, smoking, or aging. This can weaken the heart, muscles, and the lining of those arteries. I could have put this too also in my, actually I think that one was out of place, this slide. Um, because I was talking about blood, I left it here, but that's definitely more in our circulatory system. But emphysema is for the sectional respiration. Emphysema, um, it's a lung disease in which the alveoli become large and they break down. So you need those alveoli to um, the surface areas to be in the form to increase gas exchange. And so what happened is if you, instead of having these clusters, of air sacs and emphysema it breaks it down so you have a larger area so it decreases the gas exchange process and this is common around smokers and what they experience is a shortness of breath they have difficulty breathing because the alveolis have been so damaged lung cancer is linked to smoking um, but many cause is truly unknown but smoking is one of the things that it's linked to, and this is where you have an uncontrollable growth or tumor in the lung. Pneumonia is an infection of the lung. This is caused by bacteria or virus in the lung. This prevents the proper exchange of gases. Okay, and so since we were talking about the blood being an important part in the respiratory process, as far as exchanging gas, I wanted to take some time to talk about the circulatory system. So I'm going to give you just a second. Let's take a couple minutes before we move, not a couple minutes, a couple seconds, to just reflect on what we've taken in so far, and then we'll move on to the circulatory system. Let's see if we have any questions. All right, we have no questions. All right. So this is the second half of our lecture for today. We have maybe like another 45 minutes. And we're going to spend the second half of our session focusing on circulation. We're going to look at the um, lymphatic system. We're going to look at, obviously, the circulatory system. But we'll also touch on a little immunity in the second half. The first half of today was to look at some of the products that end up in the some of the products that ends up in the bloodstream and so we saw in the first half we saw that the digestive system contributed to nutrients 
in the bloodstream. Oops. Um, nutrients from the blood, from the digestive system, ending up in the bloodstream. We saw that excretory system where the blood gets filtered and clean, cleaned um, by way of the kidney. And we saw waste products produced from that. We saw that gases are added and removed from the bloodstream. And so if you know the, co the common thing between them all was their connection to the bloodstream and the blood provides, blood is the transport median to all these materials. So for the second half of today's lecture, we're gonna focus on circulation, the immunity process, including the lymphatic system, all right? All right, here we are. Okay, so there's two types of circulation, as I mentioned before. There's pulmonary circulation, which involves the movement of the blood from the heart to the lungs and back and forth. While there's some systemic circulation, which involves the flow of blood from the heart to all parts of the body except for the lungs, because the lungs are a part of the pulmonary circulatory path. So you have that pathway from the, going to the lung, then you have a pathway going to the different parts of the body. Wow, I made these pretty small. Let's zoom in a little. <laughs> All right, so there are different vessels in our bodies. The ones I'm gonna focus on today will be the artery, veins, and capillaries. And so um, blood vessels are tubes that transfer blood to and away from the body parts. And the types, once again, there's the artery. The artery, a good way to remember, transports blood away from the heart. So if it's going towards the lung, it's gonna go away from the heart to the lungs, so that was the pulmonary artery, get it? Um, the veins are going to bring the blood back to the heart, and so we saw the pulmonary vein in our last session, bringing the blood back to the heart. So arteries carry blood, blood away, veins carry them back. That's a good way to look at it. And so they're the thickest, the arteries are the thickest out of the three. The aorta, is the largest artery in the body, and that's where the blood leaves the heart and is sent to the rest of the body. So it's the largest artery to pump all that blood to all the different parts of the body. The veins, they return the blood back to the heart, but what's special about the veins is that they have these valves that prevent the backflow of blood, which is fascinating. It has these valves that as soon as the blood is pumped up, remember the heart, it's got that lub-dub motion, it's pumped up through the vein, the valves open and close. And so as they close, they prevent the blood from falling down. Remember, we're dealing with gravity here also. So um, it will prevent that from happening. And the capillaries, these guys, have been, we spoke about them in the digestive system, as far as in the small intestine, large intestine, they had the direct contact with the nutrients we're looking for, water we're looking to get into the blood, so it could be carried throughout the cell. We saw the capillaries in the kidney, in the filtering process of the blood, it was small enough to be found at the Bowman's capsule to, for blood to diffuse, for nutrients to diffuse from, or materials to diffuse from the blood into the nephron so that it could be clean and they were still surrounding the nephron so that the nutrients could go back in. So these guys are found at the most critical parts. They are involved in the exchange of materials in and out of the blood. We saw them in the alveoli of the lungs, allowing gases to move from one ear to the next. So capillaries, I'm gonna say at the start of the show here because this is where exchange takes place of nutrients, gases, waste, between the blood, the intercellular fluid, and they also connect the arteries and the veins. And so the heart, okay, I did say the capillaries as a star, but it's all controlled by the heart. And so the heart is made up of cardiac muscles and it pumps blood through the vessels. And as they're being pumped through the vessel, they create blood pressure. And think about this as a, when you turn on the water in a hose, 
as you turn on the water and the hose, you'll see that the water will create pressure and that terrible pressure will cause the hose to get stiff. It's the same idea with blood flowing through your, ves your blood vessels. As blood is flowing through them, the pressure of the blood being passed through creates a pressure along the blood vessels and that's what we record as our blood pressure. I believe I have a video here to check out the heart. Yes. In the heart, the circulation of blood starts from the right side. The blood is transported from the heart to the lungs in order to receive oxygen. The blood then flows back into the heart. The heart pumps this oxygenated blood to all other parts of the body. Thus, we have learned about the heart. All right. So I put that one in just as a quick overview to see the general function of the blood of the heart as far as it's going to pick up oxygenated blood and it's that oxygenated blood that's sent all over the body to, I keep saying drop off oxygen, but to <laughs> deliver oxygen to where it's needed to carry out much of the metabolic processes. Let's um, look a little bit more detail at, you know what, let me go back to that previous video so we could look at different parts before we get into certain disorders and problems of the heart. <clears throat> In the following video, you will learn about the heart. The heart is located in the chest cavity. The lower portion of the heart is tilted slightly towards the left. The size of the heart is about the size of a fist. Closing your fingers in the direction of your palm will make a fist. The heart is divided into four chambers. Thumb is too big here. Serious. Here we go. All right, so I wanted to take a closer look at these chambers to see what's going on. So the first two, the top chambers here. So we have this area here, which is referred to as the left atrium. A lot of time as you're looking, as you're in your studies and you're looking at the heart to decide which side is left, which side is right, it usually tilts over to the right. And so here's the left atrium, here's the left ventricle. So the left atrium job is to receive that deoxygenated blood. That's that blood that's returning from the parts of the body. So it's returning from, it's, yes, the rest of the body tissue. So it's full of carbon dioxide. And so it enters here through the upper super vena cava and bring it here into this atrium. The blood will then pass through these valves. And so as it passes through the valves, the valves um, will open, allowing the blood to flow into the left ventricle. The left ventricle will then pass the blood over through these pulmonary veins, sorry, the pulmonary arteries. And those are going to take the blood over to the lung, pick up the oxygen, get rid of the carbon dioxide, and it will enter back into the heart by way of the pulmonary vein which will enter into the right atrium. The right atrium will then pass it through the, the valve down into the right ventricle. And the right ventricle will then pump the blood up through the aorta, and then the aorta sends the blood out through the different parts of the body, except for the lungs, because these guys here are responsible for taking it to and from the lung. So I just wanted to stop here so that you could see um, that it's the septum, it's divided by this thick tissue here um, that divides it into the left and the right side of the heart and that the ventricle, the bottom areas, is what pumps the blood, whereas the top areas receive the blood. And um, the right ventricle is the thickest part because it has to pump that blood all throughout the body so it's thick and strong. So that just gives you a little more review of the parts of the heart. Let's look at some problems that may arise.
I think I have another video here. A specialized cell located in the right atrium near the superior vena cava is called the sinoatrial node. A small mass of tissue situated in the wall of the atrial septum is called atrioventricular node. At the upper end of the ventricular space, the AV node is separated as right and left atrioventricular bundle branches. Each bundle branches have the breakup into fine fibers called the Purkin J fibers. It will take 0.1 seconds for receiving impulse from SA node to AV node. In the meantime, it finishes the contraction of atria. The AV node conveys the electrical impulse to the apex of the myocardium via the bundle branches and the Purkin J fibers. The blood is pumped out of the ventricles when the wave of ventricular contraction begins. Right, so I wanted to show you this a quick video on that contraction process of how the blood is moving from one section to the next, uh, the nerve impulse that's sent throughout the heart to cause this to happen. And then talk about um, coronary thrombosis. I, if um, there's a blockage of one of the arteries um, that's carrying the blood to the heart, this blockage of blood flow to the heart muscle will then, which it can become damaged from a lack of oxygen if the blood is not being passed to the heart muscle itself. Remember, the heart is a muscle, and that needs to be fed with all the nutrients and gases in order to work, in order to feed, to send the blood to different parts of the body. The blood itself, I mean, I've been talking about blood this entire time, but let's take a second just to review what blood is and what it's made up of. So um, blood is a liquid that transport materials throughout the body within the blood vessels. So the red blood cells, their characteristics, of, as I've shown before, are round and globular looking. Uh, they contain hemoglobin, and it's the hemoglobin that carries the oxygen and those gases called like carbon dioxide to and from the body. Um, we have um, platelets. That's also we're going to see make up the blood and white blood cells. Um, the platelets, their job is to keep, to prevent blood loss through clotting. And we're going to see the white blood cell more evolved in the immune system. In the I following think, media, yes. you will learn about blood. Let's take a look. The blood vessels consist of a constantly circulating fluid called blood. They provide nutrition to the body by transporting the digested food from the small intestine. Blood also supplies oxygen to various parts of the body from the lungs. Removal and transportation of wastes from various cells and organelles is also performed by the blood. Blood is filled with numerous cells of different types. Oh, wow. I'm telling you, I am. Such a click. I'm so excited. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So um, this is a breakdown of the different components that make up the blood. So we have the red blood cells, which is represented with the red globular shape. We have the platelets, which are the little white specks found throughout. And uh, we have the white blood cells, which are irregular shape. They have that white clear section around them. Oh, they're labeled right there. All of these are being passed through this liquid, this fluid that's referred to as plasma. So we're going to see a lot of nutrients are found in the plasma itself. So this was a good image to show you the components of blood. Blood is filled with numerous cells of different types. The red blood cells are one of its types, which are composed of a red pigment called hemoglobin. The transportation of oxygen by the blood is accomplished successfully only when the hemoglobin binds with oxygen. 
the hemoglobin causes the blood to be red in color. Another type of cell is a white blood cell. The white blood cells provide immunity by preventing the entry of pathogens into the body. When we fall down, blood starts to ooze from the cut. Later, a dark red clot appears, which stops the bleeding. The formation of a dark red clot is caused by another kind of fragment, called platelets. The fluid presented in the blood is called plasma. The plasma holds the cells, which are suspended in the blood. Thus, you have learned about blood. And guys, even though it was very vague, um, the platelets, that's controlled by a lot of enzyme activity um, to actually cause that clot in and those fibers to be formed. Let's go on and talk about the white blood cell. And so um, the white blood cell is going to lead us towards the end of our lecture for today. So the white blood cells, they have no definite shape. They fight against diseases by making antibodies. Any foreign substance, such as bacteria, viruses, we refer to these as antigens. They have antigens on their surface. And uh, antibodies are made to fight off these antigens. So here are two categories. We're showing you two different groups of white blood cells. And so now let's break the groups down in. So um, we have different types of white blood cells for different purposes. I'm just going to skim over these. Remember, you have access to slow the video down, to go back and look at these in greater details. And so we have one type that's the monocytes. These guys are large cells. They have a um, nucleus. They have a large nucleus. Their function, they tend to um, engulf pathogens. These are foreign substances, such as um, like bacteria. Um, the presence of, they could engulf in, any kind of antigens. Let me see, monocytes later differentiate into macrophage. And so we talk about macrophage as in, if there's a, a pathogen that might break through, through your, the first line of defense, we'll see these monocytes become pathogens and they'll engulf. So let's talk about the pathogens a little, sorry, macrophage. They'll create themselves into macrophage. So the macrophage who used to be monocytes, they enter, they're able to enter tissue spaces. And so they are larger and um, they have a lot of enzyme properties. And so these are the guys, once again, if something gets to that first line of defense, they could go and engulf and destroy pathogens. Lymphocytes, these guys now, um, they circulate in the blood and in your lymphs. They consist of 20 to 40% of your blood and comprise of 99% of the blood in your lymph. And so we're going to talk about these guys more when we go to the lymphatic system. They're subdivided into three groups, these lymphocytes. They are the B cells, the T cells, and our natural killer cells. Then there's the neutral cell, eosinophils, and um, basophils. So these guys, um, let's look at their characteristics. Um, the first one, the neurophils, they are dense, microlube nucleus. That's part of their characteristics. They are pale cytoplasm. Their lifespan is about a few days, and they consist of anywhere from 50 to percent to 70 percent of the circulating white blood cells that you have. The initial fills, these guys now, um, they have this uh, irregular shape um, nucleus. They are more granule in the cytoplasm. Let's see what other interesting facts. 1 to 3% circulate throughout the blood cell. And the basophils, same thing with these guys. Um, you'll find them throughout the 
um, throughout the blood, and we say that they make up less than 1% of the circulate in white blood cell. All right, so this is, you can always come back to the slide. It's a description of the different types of white blood cells that you'll come across. And so we have um, things such as uh, leukemia. Leukemia is cancer in the bone marrow when there's too much or too many white blood cells. <clears throat> in the lymphatic system, this system is made up of vessels that allow extra fluid. So we're, it's this whole last section of our lecture is kind of blended because the circulatory, we're talking about the blood, what they're made up of. We see the white blood cells, which play a part in the lymphatic system and the immune system. So I've kind of just comprised these three systems into one because they're so interconnected. So the lymphatic system, they're made up of vessels also, and they allow the ex extra or excess fluid from the intercellular space to return to the blood. So extra fluid, their job is to get that back into the bloodstream. So we refer to um, the intercellular fluid. This will help to make up the plasma that when plasma diffuses out of the capillaries, that makes up the intercellular fluid. So once the intercellular fluid enters into the lymph vessels, it's now called lymph. So extracellular fluid in the lymph vessel that's been diffused into the lymph vessels, it's now referred to as lymph. Then there are lymph nodes along the lymphatic system and these lymph nodes, they help to filter our foreign substance from the lymph, that's that fluid, before that could enter it into the bloodstream. So once again, let's get this one more time. So we have um, extra fluid that's floating around um, amongst, around the cell. Um, we, have, we refer to that as intercellular fluid. And so that fluid diffuses from like the plasma out of the capillaries. And so that fluid, once it gets into the lymphatic vessels, are referred to as lymph. And along the lymphatic system, you have nodes, and these nodes are there to filter out the lymph fluid before returning it back to the bloodstream. Crazy, fascinating. So the spleen is an organ that's located near the stomach, and it's made out of lymphatic tissue. This then functions to filter out bacteria. Some of the worn out blood cells are carried here and it stores extra blood for emergency. So it's our blood bank in our body. And so these antigens that we find, these antigens then can lead to an immune response. So pathogens have antigens that have markers, cell receptors, are very specific. Okay, let, let me get my pencil and kind of show you what I'm talking about. Maybe if we have, so we say there are pathogens out there. All right, and so the pathogens, these are examples of our bacteria and our viruses. All right, these are pathogens but attach on the pathogens or these markers and these markers are referred to as antigens. Okay, so I'm using both words um, interchangeably, but I want you to get an idea as they're both referenced in, in this case, the foreign substance that's entering the body. And um, also, when we spoke about blood type back with genetics, each one of our blood types have antigen markers on them. And so this is why only certain blood type can give to anyone. Um, for example, um, blood type O, blood type O, do not have any antigen markers on 
on them. So that's why blood type O is the universal donor because it could give to blood type A and it can also give to blood type B. Let's put different markers on there. So blood type, they could give to any of those guys. Whereas a blood type B could receive, besides O, can only receive from that specific blood type because then the antigens would be different and that will cause the blood the, to clot. So B can give to B, blood type A can give to A, but O can give to A and B because it doesn't have any markers. So it wouldn't trigger that reaction where the bloods would actually clot. Blood type AB, on the other hand, has both markers on the outside. It has markers of both A and B. So because it has markers from A and B, blood type AB is the universal receiver, recipient, because they can receive blood from blood type A because it has the same marker or blood type B because of the same marker or it could get from O because O has no markers. And so we're looking at antigen. These are these protein markers on the surface of the cell. So put this aside, blood aside for right now. We're looking at pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. And so as these guys enter inside the blood, they have markers which are unlike the markers in your body. So your body will recognize those as a foreign substance. And then there will be an entire immune reaction to getting rid of this marker that doesn't belong. And we'll see also there's some disorders like autoimmune disease. This is where your body will see its natural, its own tissues as foreign substance, and it will send out, um, send out a response, trigger response to destroy those tissues. And that's an example of an autoimmune response. Let's continue. So in immunity, we use words such as, ant such as antigens. So antigens, as I mentioned before, are found on blood surfaces and on any foreign substances. Antibodies are produced in response to antigens. So antigens are these proteins that are produced specifically by the white blood cell. And we saw that when I gave you the examples of white blood cells, specifically the B cells, in response to the presence of the antigens. So what's going to happen is each antibody is specific to an antigen. Just as I, when we saw enzymes and substrate, there was that specific key, that specific match. The same thing happens here. To every antigen, there is going to be a specific antibody to destroy it. There's different types of immunity. You have active immunity and passive immunity. And so active immunity is very specific. This is when the individual builds his or her own antibodies by having the disease or a form of it. So you can you could have been exposed to the virus and then your body build up. Your body was activated, let's say that, to make these antibodies. So you could have been exposed to it by where you caught like a cold or um, you picked up the disease, or you could have it could have been activated through you receiving a vaccination. And we'll see that vaccination is a mild or a weakened form of the virus to force your body to trigger an immune response. So that's an active response. And then there's a passive immunity, which is a nonspecific. And this is the one that you were born with. This is passed from, from mother to child. These are antibodies for another reason to thank your mother here is because this is an antibody that's produced by another organism and then given to someone. So, and I say specifically like mom to the child at birth. 
So you have active, where you could activate the system, an immune response to allow your body to produce the antibodies, and then there's a passive nonspecific immunity where you receive antibodies from another organism. So let's talk about your body's response to specific defense. And so the first line of defense is, is a nonspecific defense, and this has to deal with the physical barriers. And so your first barrier we're going to look at, we have our skin as the first line of barrier. We have mucus, we have cilia in our nose and a line in the respiratory tract to try to get rid of any kind of invader. So the skin itself, um, in your sweat, you have, you have sweat, you have oils, waxes. These all have materials that are toxic to bacteria. And so that's why they serve as our first line of defense. We have mucus, and along the mucus, mucus is there to trap pathogens from going further into the respiratory system. They're there to block these pathogens from getting further. So um, in our line of defense, there are first nonspecific, because it doesn't matter what the pathogen is. This first line of defense is there to stop anything. The oil is going to kill the enzyme that's found in the oil, the sweat. They're just going to kill anything. And the mucus is going to trap anything. And so that's what I mean by being nonspecific. Our second line of defense is also nonspecific. But um, here we're going to see some of the macrophages could get involved in this phase. We spoke about the macrophages before. And so this is if we have a bacteria or a pathogen that will get past that first line of defense. So it got past the skin, the cilia, the tear, uh, mucus. Got, once it gets past that area, we our second line of defense that's there, it's also nonspecific. So we'll see the macrophages will come out, and what we'll see is there would be inflammation. So there'll be swelling in this area. And so then this changes the environment that it's into an environment that's not conducive to growth and development of this bacteria. It's there to destroy it. And also we could see a fever, an increase. Our body could respond by increasing our body temperature. And so this is our body's intent on making the environment uncomfortable, really, for this pathogen. And so when you're sick to have a fever, it's not really a bad thing. It's um, when the fever gets too high, it's an issue. But having a mild fever is not a bad thing. It's your body's way of trying to make the environment not comfortable for the pathogen to dwell and grow in. And, um, you know, so you want to allow that fever to happen. But if we have it where, you know, like I'm, what I mean by that is not rushed to get medicine to subdue that fever. But obviously, if the fever is getting high, it could become um, a serious problem. For example, uh, remember if your body temperature is too high, that can affect enzyme action. Remember, enzymes work within specific temperature. And so we want it where enzymes are still active and able to carry out their function. And so if your body temperature gets too high, it can affect those functions from taking place. So the walk away with from here, the takeaway, is that a fever is not a bad thing, but we don't want it to get to the extreme to create more problems. All right, so that's our second line of defense. Our third line of defense is very specific. This is acquired immunity. This is when there's a triggered response to a pathogen. In this response, we're going to see uh, memory cells being created. It falls into two categories. We have cell-mediated and humoral response. Our component of this is very specific immune. Those lymphocytes we spoke about, um, the T cells and the B cells we're going to see come into play. The B cells are white blood cells that are made by the bone marrow and complete their development in the spleen. They remain in the body as memory B cells to combat if the virus was to ever show up again. 
The antibodies are proteins that will attack the pathogen. Remember, they're gonna be very specific. The T cells are mostly made in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus gland. Let's take a look at the cell-mediated response. The cell-mediated remedi cell response um, will include the cytotoxin T cells. They're activated, they're there to recognize and destroy cells that have been infected, infected by pathogens. Whereas the humorous response, it's occurring at the same time as the cell-mediated response. And what's happening here is those B cells are being activated in your body and form plasma cells to produce antibodies. And so those antibodies, once they're produced, will destroy the pathogen. You'll have your memory cells that are created, and the T cells will be there to recognize it. Vaccines are harmless. Vaccine is when you treat a virus, a pathogen, to make them harmless, and you're going to introduce them to the body. And by introducing them to the body, they'll create they'll create antibodies. And your allergies work in the same way, except they trigger an immune response, but your body's triggering an immune response to a non-harmful substance. So we see where a virus or a pathogen causes an immune response to occur. An allergic reaction caused the same response to take place, where in, this, um, in turn they'll secrete histamines. And so there's a fluid that's released because of its reaction to a non-harmful substance such as mold, dander, um, pollen. These are all non-harmful substances like a virus or a pathogen, but your body received them the same where it will trigger that immune response and trigger the cells to release histamine. And that's why you would take an antihistamine to combat that histamine. <clears throat> All right, so I wanted to go back to um, vaccines and just this entire immune response to give you an overview as to how that would work. And when we talk about the cell reaction to it, there is, um, you want to think about it as this, as soon as that pathogen enters the body, the chemical is sent out by white blood cells to trap. So like a macrophage will come and trap that pathogen. And as it traps that pathogen, um, it sends out a signal, a chemical signal throughout the body to try to find the cell that would know how to destroy that pathogen that's entered into your body. And so as it's forming, as it's trying to find the cell that can destroy it, you know, that pathogen is actually breaking down or destroying cells because the virus rely on the whole cell to replicate itself. And so in the meantime, that's why sometimes you're sick, you're sick for a couple of days, you're feeling terrible, you have a sore throat. That's because um, those um, viruses are breaking down those cells and destroying those cells. And you, you might get um, a stuffy nose or runny nose, and that's part of your body's response to dealing with that. Runny nose is trying to flush that pathogen out. And so as your body is going through all of this, one of the things that it's going through is trying to find that cell that will know how to make those antibodies. And so once that cell has been identified, it will then make antibodies and that information will stay in your body as um, a memory cell. So if you were to be exposed to that virus again, if you were to ever be exposed, the information or the process would be quicker to go and find um, the antibodies to attack those cells and destroy them right away. And so when we take a vaccine, a vaccine is um, taking that weakened form of the virus to help your body to trigger. So when you get the flu shot, that's what it's doing. It's triggering your body to make those antibodies so that you have a surplus, you have that information already stored in your body. So if you need it, if you come across um, the flu, you already have those antibodies build up in your system to fight them off and um, so that you can get rid of it right away. All right, so we have gone through, let me just discard. 
some of the things I wrote on. We have gone through several systems today. And as I close for, the, for today, I just want to quickly take you back up to where we started to show you that um, we've covered it all, that the digestive system, I broke it into two sections today. The first hour, we took the digestive system, showing that nutrients are broken down outside of the cell. Once they've been broken down outside of the cell, let me just enlarge this for you. Once they've been broken down outside of the cell, they are then absorbed into the blood by way of the small intestine, connection to the small intestine, and connection to the large intestine. Once it's absorbed into the blood, those nutrients are carried now to the cells where they diffuse into the cell. So glucose could diffuse in, remember we spoke about respiration a few ses sessions ago, cellular respiration, relying on that glucose to be diffused in. And we have those amino acids, we have those glyceroid. All of these um, micronutrients will get absorbed in, or diffused into the cell, and be used throughout the cell. And um, excretory system, we saw where the blood is then transferred through the kidney where it's filtered. And some nutrients are taken out, the good stuff's put back in, the stuff that we don't need forms urine and that exit the body through, stored in the bladder and then exit the body through the urethra. Then we have the respiratory system which gave us the exchange of gases, oxygen going in, carbon dioxide coming out. Then we spend the last hour talking about the blood, the heart pumping the blood throughout the system and those vessels, how they play a role in it. The immune system helping us to become immune and trigger an immune response to pathogen and the lymphatic system that helps to clean out that intercellular fluid. All right, so I hope you guys got a lot of great information from this. Remember this video is available for you to access at any time. And so um, we're going to end for today. We'll have review sessions. Don't forget to join me. I have four review sessions focusing on the materials we've covered in this video. So I would love if you could join me for those. I'm available for questions. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you.